We're glad that you can join our Wednesday night <clears throat> Bible study here at the Walton Chapel Church of Christ in Lafette, Tennessee. This is our 18th lesson in the Sermon on the Mount series. Last week we studied from Matthew 6, 16 through 18, which dealt with fasting. Tonight we will be looking at laying up treasures in heaven and what Jesus taught on that subject. Be prepared to look at our text, which is Matthew 6, 19 through 24. If you want to grab your Bible text, we'll be flipping there in just a few moments. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Before we read our text, it might be interesting to look at the sermon as a whole up to this point. Matthew 5, Jesus described the characteristics of the person who would seek the kingdom of heaven. The characteristics, or the Beatitudes, which we mainly call them, were poor in spirit, mournful over sin, meek, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. If a person has these attitudes, he would certainly be blessed, even when he is persecuted by a world that hates righteousness. And the world would know that he was righteous since he would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Christ then asserts that he had come to fulfill the law and therefore had the authority to tell the scribes and the Pharisees how they had failed to keep the law. In fact, they taught that <clears throat> and acted contrary to the law. In the rest of Matthew 5, Jesus condemns them for their teachings on anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and treatment of our enemies. Then in, Matthew, then in chapter 6, Jesus tells them that what the outward practice of religion should be. Here again, our deeds must be from the heart and not to be seen merely by men. In the last three lessons we studied giving, praying, and fasting. The emphasis should be on doing these things in secret so that God who sees us in secret will reward them openly. Jesus in the rest of the chapter 6 and the first part of chapter 7 gives them three prohibitions. Do not lay up your treasures on earth, do not worry, and do not judge. The last two, we will get those in a little later lessons later on. Of course, the religious leaders should have known them, but again, they failed to make the proper application of the law of Moses and other writings in the Old Testament. Now let's read our text for tonight, which we will deal with our treasures and how to store them. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where, in, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be dull, be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What do you treasure? Is it wealth, as we just read about? Is it prestige, power? Or could it be all of them? In Mark 10, 17 through 22, it, record, it records there an instance about a rich young man. This rich young man came running up to Jesus and even knelt before him. The young man wanted to know what to do to inherit, and to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to keep the commandments, the law of Moses. He claims to have kept them from his youth, but that was not enough. If you would, flip to Mark chapter 10. We'll pick up reading verse 21. We'll see what Jesus said to him. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. As you read this verse, there's one thing that stands out to me as Jesus looking at him and loved him. 
Why did he point? Why did he say that Jesus loved him? Why did he? Was it because he had earthly and physical things? No. Jesus loved him because he told him that one thing that he lacked to have the treasure in heaven. See, as us as Christians, that should be our goal. We should be striving to tell others about the treasures that are in heaven. As Jesus said here, He loved him. He looked at him and said He loved him. We must do the same. The next verse said that the man went away sorrowful because he had great riches. Notice that Jesus did not dispute the rich man's claims of keeping the law, nor did He condemn him for being rich. Jesus told him what to do with his wealth so that he could have treasures in heaven. Jesus also added, Take up your cross and follow me. But the love of great riches kept him from doing that. What kind of treasure is worth keeping us out of heaven? That is a question we must ask ourselves. Going back to verse 19 of our text, we see that Jesus gave three reasons not to lay up treasures on earth. From our experiences, we know why. They can be eaten by insect or other creatures. They can corrode or they can be stolen or lost. Cloth, especially wool, can be eaten by moss. Food can be eaten by rodents, insects, or fungus. In other words, food has a limited shelf life. Most metals, like iron, are subject to rust and corrosion. Precious metals and diamonds are more stable, but they can be <clears throat> stolen from you or even devalued. This is exactly what happened to the Hunt brothers on March 27, 1980. They had tried to corner the market on silver, and at one time their estimated wealth was $5 billion. Then the silver market collapsed in 1980. All that silver they had brought on margin was now devalued, and they did not have the money to pay for it. They did survive the initial collapse by pledging their huge oil empire. However, through a chain of events resulting partly from that collapse, they had to file bankruptcy eight years later. Things like that happen on earth. But Jesus says in verse 20, that your treasures in heaven are safe. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said in Proverbs 23, 4, and 5, that wealth is fleeting. Since it is fleeting, don't weary yourself trying to get it. But what happens should you become wealthy? Well, Solomon even has the answer for that too. He, lo he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. That's in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10. It says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied. We are always wanting that one more extra thing. If you have silver, you want gold. If you want gold, you want diamonds. And so forth and so forth. We must be satisfied with what the Lord has given us. Think about what He has given us. Other translations such as the ESV say money instead of silver. But the fact remains that riches of any kind will not satisfy. We'll talk about that a little more later on. Like everything else that Jesus talked about, where we put our treasures is a hard issue. In verse 21, Jesus says that where your treasures are, your heart will be also. What do you value in life? Is it fortune? Fame? Power? Or maybe it's all of them. Whatever it is, that is where you will spend your time and energy. I have seen people pursue interests to, ex to an extent that they have destroyed their own health. And some have even committed suicide when they failed. If your treasure is on earth, your heart will experience much disappointment. But if your treasure is in heaven, you will not suffer great disappointment. Because your reward is incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away. Remember the great verses of Matthew 7, 24 through 27. talks about the storms of life there. We have two foundations that we can build on. We can build on the rock, or we can build on the sand. If we build on the rock, which is our Lord and Savior, 
Storms of life will not overwhelm us because our foundation is built on the Word of God. That's where we need to be establishing our foundation. Verse 22, Jesus says that the lamp of the body is the eye. Our eyes are the means that God gave us to detect detect light, and therefore our only source of vision. If we have a clear eye, we will see everything properly. If the eye is bad, then there is no means for for light to enter the body, and it is full of darkness. Jesus goes on to say, If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That is a valuable question that we need to all ask ourselves. How great is that darkness? If the only source of light that we have is blocked by darkness, we have no hope. We must guard what goes into our eyes. You also remember in 1 John 2, 16, remember there is a such thing as lust of the eye. We must guard against those things. The world is in darkness and ruled by the prince of darkness. Jesus Christ is the true light. The Apostle John says in 1 John 1, 5 through 7, that we must walk in the light to have fellowship with Christ. Our choice is clear. Either walk in darkness and seek the things of this world, or walk with Christ. Pretty clear. Pretty point blank. If we walk with Christ, the treasures of this world will not be so important. And that leads into verse 24, which says that no one can serve two masters. From the Old Testament, the great leader Joshua put it this way. It's one of my favorite verses. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that, our, that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods... Your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the stance we need to have with Joshua. We need to make that commitment unto one, and that is the true and living only high God. The Israelites could not be faithful to God and worship idols. We cannot be faithful to God and put our trust in and our riches. We must not let our treasures on earth become our idols. We must remember that things here on this earth are temporal. Earthly possessions may decay or rust, be stolen or burned to the ground. Today we have fancy locks and security systems to protect our houses and internet security for our computers. But ordinary thieves and cyber criminals can still break through and steal. We could be broke in seconds. But even if our earthly treasures last throughout our own lifetime, we cannot take them with us. Later on in Matthew chapter 6, and verse 33, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We must seek Him first. Seek His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We must seek Him first. God becomes our master Since we can't be loyal to serve two masters, that would effectively get rid of one, and we could focus on our God if we seek Him first. That will eliminate mammon from our vision, from our sight. It will not be our God. Remember the parable of the rich man who wanted to tear down his barns and build bigger ones? This parable is found in Luke 12, 13 through 21. Here's what he said in God's answer to him. And I will say to my soul, So, you have many goods laid up for you many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. When we make that commitment to lay up treasures here on this earth, we are not rich to God. That'll be our focus. We must not let that happen. Obviously, we, went, we want to have treasures in heaven. I would like to return to what Solomon said about riches. He said in Ecclesiastes 5.10 that they would not satisfy. 
We read that verse earlier. But in addition, he recognized the man has a higher purpose. He has a higher calling. And that everything else was vanity. The conclusion can be found in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, which reads, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is man's all. This is man's all. We are here to serve God, Him alone. It's not about how much we accumulate in this life. It's about serving Him. And one final scripture as we close. Psalms 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourselves also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. If our desires and treasure is truly in heaven, think about this, if our desires and and treasure is truly in heaven, we will study the Word of God. We will tell others about it. We will use our energy, our time, everything that God gives us to fully invest in Him. And also we will keep His commandments. We must make sure that our treasures are laid up in heaven and not here on this earth. As we close, we'd like to go in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. Please, dear Father, that all things that we said are done, we've had authority by thy word, dear Father, and that you are delighted in it, dear Father. Help us, dear Father, to always put thee first and to make sure that our treasures are laid up in heaven. Not to be caught up in the worldly cares affairs of this place, dear Father, but to focus on thee. We ask, dear Father, that we focus to be more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When He was tempted here on this earth, dear Father, He went to Thy Word each and every time. He went to that cross, so bore the sins of this whole world, that so all could have eternal hope of salvation. We would humble ourselves in Thy sight, dear Father, and submit to Thy will. Please help us, dear Father, to grow stronger and closer to Thee every day, to use our time wisely, our energy wisely, dear Father, to make this life about serving Thee and less about ourselves. If You would, dear Father, please forgive us of our sins. Please help us to truly realize our sins when we do, that we have a godly sorrow, that our heart is pricked, dear Father, and that we turn from those things and turn to Thee. If You would, dear Father, please be this nation and the world over. Help this virus to go away, dear Father, most especially, dear Father, the virus of sin, that all humble themselves in Thy sight and turn to Thee. Please be with us now. To the rest of this day and on through our lives. Son's blessed name. Amen.